Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Wanted to make sure you weren't seeing the presenter mode. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, um, so I'm a horticulturist in, in Gage County, but I also uh, have a, I dabbled in entomology in college as well. So um, I uh, want to talk about turf insects tonight. And one of our, we really don't have a ton of uh, damaging turf insects, um, but the number one culprit would be this fella right here. This is the white grub. Um, and these are, we get problems with these every year. Um, and certain people, um, it's a recurring problem. So when, usually once you start seeing white grubs, you're gonna continue to have to treat for them. Um, and so white grub uh, the, is what we see from the damage. Um, we call that the white grub and it's actually the immature form of a lot of different scarab beetles that we have in Nebraska. The most common here um, would be that June beetle or the mass chafer um, is probably your most common culprit. Uh, then the Japanese beetle, which we're probably most of us are familiar with, and then the May and June beetles and the green June beetles can be problematic, but not quite as bad as the other two species. Um, where we tend to see the problems are where uh, they're attracted to lights. So a lot of times people will call and we'll talk, we'll be talking about the brown spots in their yard, and it happens to be where a house light or a street light shines on the yard and that's the area where they tend where they see more of this browning showing up and the reason for that is um, the the grubs or the the beetles of the grubs are um, attracted to that light and and they're active at night and then they're kind of mating up above that or in within that lower that light is and then they're just gonna go down to the ground and lay their eggs there so that's why we often see more problems maybe in the lights, but they can be anywhere really. Um, and just a fun fact, um, the green June bug, their grub is a little bit different than the others. Um, and they actually crawl on their back to move around. And you can sometimes find them in high populations um, on sidewalks or driveways around an infested yard. So that's just a fun fact, but um, here are the pictures of them. So this is the mass chafer, the June bug that we normally see. Uh, then we've got the May and June beetles, uh, the Japanese beetle, which he is a problem in a lot of uh, plants as well uh, as an adult, so not just as an immature. And then this guy, this green June beetle, which we a lot, I get a lot of calls, people confuse the green June beetle and the Japanese beetle, but the green June beetle is quite a bit bigger. And you will hear him coming from a while, uh, ways away because he buzzes very loudly. So the, the normal life cycle for like, this is the Japanese beetle life cycle and that um, mass chafer is gonna follow along pretty well or the June bug is gonna follow along pretty well with this. Um, and they have a one year lifespan or life cycle. And so uh, let's see, we are in July here. So July, August, right in here. So the, the eggs have been laid and the larvae are out and moving around. Um, and so what they're gonna do is they're gonna feed a little bit uh, yet this year, once you get uh, starting to get a little bit colder, they will move further down into the soil profile and be dormant as a later stage insta or later stage larvae through the winter months. And then um, next year, uh, around March or so, when it starts to warm up, they're going to move up in the profile, do just a little bit of feeding uh, on those turf roots, and then pupate and become an adult. And when they're adults, moving around, that's that's kind of your best time to get that grub control out um, because you want it there in the soil profile as soon as those larvae start uh, becoming active. So this is the damage uh, that we often see from white grubs. And so, as I said, they chew the roots off of our turf. And so you might start thinking, well, maybe this is one of the diseases that Kyle was just talking about in my lawn. But once you get in there, if you start kind of tugging on the turf, it'll pull up. And I've seen in cases where it actually pulls up like a piece of carpet. Um, it was actually my father-in-law's house. Um, at one time he had grubs and, and I, you know, it was the first time really seeing it. And I thought it was really neat, but not for him. Um, but uh, so it's, it's, it will, because the grass is still matted together, but it has no roots. And so it pulls up like that. And because it has no roots, that's why you're going to see those brown spots in the lawn. It doesn't have any way to get to the moisture and that, um, and so it just dries up basically. 
Um, the adults really don't do any damage to our lawns. Some of them can kind of wander around and do some damage to some other plants. Usually it's not harmful on those other plants except for that Japanese beetle. Um, but I put in each of these, I'm gonna talk about three main insects tonight um, and I put the threshold level. So if you see one or two grubs per square foot of lawn, it's probably not a huge issue. When you start to get up into the eight to 10 grubs in that square foot, then you've got more of a problem and you probably want to do some uh, management for it. Um, and so we're gonna see right now is when we're right in that prime time for seeing a lot of damage from grub control. And the other issue that we see with grubs is the problem with skunks and raccoons. And that's because they like grubs, they like to eat them. And so what they will do is um, dig around in your yard. You may not have noticed that they were digging around in the yard and, um, and then all of a sudden, or you didn't notice that you had the grubs, and then we see the damage from the skunks or the raccoons. Um, and the skunks are going to dig more of a, a cone-shaped hole, and the raccoons are going to kind of roll the turf back to get to those grubs. But um, so, uh, and that's usually when we see problems with that, it's usually too late for control for that year. And so we focus on remembering for next year to, to treat your lawn for grubs, because that's usually a, a later fall issue. So our grub control products, um, we apply, uh, can apply it to the lawn in mid-June to early July. Some of the pretty common homeowner used ones would be like Merit and Mach 2. Um, there's a lot of other products out there. You're, if you've got a lawn care company, they probably have something else different as well. Um, but these products need to be applied. I usually say about the third week of June, mid-June to, to later June is a really good time to get those uh, on the lawn, as I said, so that it's there when the, the grub, the eggs are hatching and those young grubs are moving around because it's much easier to kill that young grub versus a much bigger um, full size one. Um, and so there are some rescue treatments um, in August or September. You can use like Carborel or your seven products or Dilox. Uh, a lot of times when I talk to homeowners that late in the year, especially if we're looking at September, I'm like, you know, just go ahead and, um, do your treatments next year. Um, but if you want, you can definitely use some of those rescue treatments for them. So, um, so that's the, the white grubs. And like I said, they are gonna be your, your biggest turf insect pest. Um, so another one that we sometimes will see, uh, and this is the bluegrass billbug. Um, and so you can see a little snout here because the billbug is a weevil. And, so as I said, here is the word weevil, not like a weevil's wobble. This is a weevil. It's a type of a beetle. Um, and it feeds primarily on Kentucky bluegrass, um, but you can find it on a lot of other different grass species, perennial ryegrass, fescue, things like that. Um, there are other species that we see of this blue, of the billbug. Um, the hunting billbug is more on zoysia and Bermuda grass. So if you've got zoysia lawn, um, you may see more problems with that one. And then there's also a Denver billbug that we can find on Kentucky bluegrass as well. Um, when I was doing my research for the program here, I was searching around, just looking at other um, university publications on billbugs. And it turns out that it was first reported in the US in Nebraska in 1890. So um, we were the lucky ones that found it first. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> and I don't know if you wanna be the first one to find a new insect. Um, and then it, it really became quite a pest throughout the United States. Um, and recently, I, I don't see a lot of problems with bluegrass or with billbugs. Um, I don't get very many calls that it points me in the direction of a billbug. And that's because we've got a lot of new resistant varieties. So back in like the 80s, um, they had a lot of problem with it, uh, with the billbug. More of the problem was in Western Nebraska, not as much in the Lincoln Omaha area. Um, but uh, now that time's gone on, we've kind of transitioned those um, susceptible varieties of bluegrass to the more resistant varieties. And so sometimes it just takes a little longer for, you know, to get that resistant variety moved throughout. And so, you know, even lawns that are 20 years old have the resistant varieties in most cases. Um, and so um, this one, like the green June bug, um, you can actually find these, uh, the bill bugs kind of wandering around on the sidewalk or the driveway near infested turf. So 
that's one of your indications that you have a problem if you're seeing them kind of wander around. So this is the life cycle of this bill bug goes from an egg and then it goes through these five instars or uh, larval stages and then it pupates and becomes an adult. Um, so the adults are going to overwinter in sheltered locations. So somewhere near the turf, but um, a spot where they will live through the winter. So that's why we, you know, make sure we clean things up in the fall that can help reduce populations of, of different insects and the bill bug would be one of them. <clears throat> and then uh, late April or early May, um, they're going to become active and mate because they're adults and they're ready to go. And so then they're going to lay eggs. And then um, it's the larvae that does the damage here as well. Um, and those are going to hatch and feed in the turf stems. And so as they grow, they're going to feed in those stems and then um, move down into the soil and feed on the roots as well. Um, and then about mid-July, they will pupate. Um, and so then you've got those adults that will merge a few weeks later and just for a short period of time. And then they're going to find their overwintering site as fall comes along. <clears throat> so this is why it's very important to, um, you know, clean up leaf debris and things like that uh, in the fall so that they don't have a place to, to hide and stay bundled up during the winter. So this is some of the damage that they do. Um, <clears throat> as, so as the larvae feed on the insides of the stems, they'll actually kind of leave this sawdust-like plant material and it can kill the plant depending on where they're feeding, you know, the lower they are, uh, the more damage it, it will be on the crown of the plant and in the roots of the plant. And so um, kind of reminds me of when we see squash vine borer damage in our zucchini plants or those um, where you get that sawdust like material that's left behind. Um, and then the plant doesn't get that movement of moisture and all of that, so. <clears throat> The grass will turn brown like this picture on the bottom here, um, especially in those larger populations. Um, and so, um, but the, the thing with all three of these is that the damage from all three of them can look about the same and they can also resemble those diseases that Kyle was talking about. Um, so you really need to make sure that you know what you have to know when to control it and how to control it. Um, and so, as I said with the last one, the threshold level here is, you know, if you're finding one larvae per square foot or more, then you probably need to do something to treat for them. They're not giving you a very high threshold on this one. And so with, uh, for managing these, as I said, the, the resistant varieties and the majority of our new varieties that we have on Kentucky bluegrass are going to be resistant to uh, bill bugs. And since it's been around since the, what did I say, 1890, um, that it's, that most, I mean, we're gonna have pretty much all of our grass species are going to have, uh, are gonna be resistant. So um, that's a good thing uh, for the length of time. Um, but if you do have them, we're treating these in early to mid-May and you can use that same product that we use for grub control, that Merit, um, or you can just use a general use in seven. Um, will work pretty well for them. But you want to make sure that you know that you have the bill bugs um, prior to those treatments. You know, if you're, if you're not finding the grubs, maybe you can check and see if you've got bill bugs. If you've got an older lawn, especially um, those, uh, you know, if it's been there for generations, then it may not be resistant. Um, and so you can flush the adults from the grass um, with a tablespoon of pyrethrin in one gallon of water and then just pour that over a square foot of the lawn. So I like, um, this reminds me of how you figure out if uh, you have um, chinch bugs in buffalo grass. So you take one of those coffee cans and you set it down over a portion of the grass, maybe the brown area, and then you can just pour that, you know, whether it be a tablespoon of pyrethrin or a little bit of soap in some water and pour it over that so it concentrates right there. And if you've got that coffee can around it, those bugs are just gonna float to the top. Um, so you could do the same concept here with these bill bugs. Um, wanna wait a few minutes, 15 minutes, um, and then just see if you've got some adults that come to the surface for that. So um, like I said, if you've got more than one or one or more in that square foot, then you, um, you're gonna wanna treat for that. So 
Um, and then you can also use a pitfall trap to determine the presence of billbugs. So I threw in a picture here of a pitfall trap. Um, and it is exactly as, as it sounds. It's a uh, pit that the insect falls into. So you're going to basically put some type of a cup um, so that the top of the cup is right at the soil level. And so as that bug wanders across the grass, it's not going to know that's there and it falls in. Um, so you can check that and see if you find some bill bugs in there. A lot of people, uh, when they put these pitfall traps in, they'll put two cups. And so that way they don't have to dig out the initial one. Each time they want to check their trap, they can just pull out the insert cup. Um, and that works pretty well um, for ease of checking and uh, seeing what it is. You'll find all kinds of fun stuff if you use a pitfall trap, I'll tell you. Um, when you're trapping for any insect, you'll find all kinds of random insects that will fall into those. Insects aren't very smart. They just kind of wander into things. Um, and then the last one I wanted to talk about here um, is the sod webworm. So this one is another one, um, not quite as common, but we do see it from time to time. Um, and it's kind of a funny looking creature. Um, they will call them sometimes lawn moths. Um, and so um, common on Kentucky bluegrass, tall and fine leaf fescues, zoysia grass, buffalo grass, prefer that bluegrass, but pretty much, I mean, this covers the, the whole range of grasses that we see in Nebraska. I think maybe uh, Bermuda grass is on that list too, but I left it off because we don't grow a lot of that here in Nebraska. Um, so when I was, as when I was working on this project, I uh, also, I was outside, you know, with my dog wandering around and I saw things kind of jumping up and I thought, well, I, I don't have these, right? And so I got down and looked real close and actually those were uh, little tiny grasshoppers, like baby grasshoppers that were wandering around. Um, sometimes when you might think you have these lawn moths, uh, maybe they're leaf hoppers. Um, and there's a couple other things that could be um, jumping around um, out of the grass. And so it's, you know, it, as with any of them, it's real important to make sure that you have the right species that you know what you actually have in your lawn. Um, and so this one, um, when they're at rest, they're gonna fold their wings down, kind of curled up almost. So it kind of looks like a cigar. As you can see in this picture here, just kind of rolled up a little bit. So, um, and then they have that snout like projection um, extending from the head. And so this is, like I said, notice when people flush them out when they're walking through the lawn. Um, so if you're not sure, you know, we can um, just get down on your hands and knees and see if you can catch a couple of them. Um, and they, they are going to fly more zigzagging um, and quickly return to the grass and more often at dusk, um, whereas the ones I was looking at when I noticed something bouncing around in my grass, uh, they were kind of just bouncing up at me. So um, definitely, you know, it's a fun experiment um, as an entomologist to just go and see what you got that's bouncing around at you in the grass. <laughs> um, and so this is the life cycle of that sod webworm. And so again, you go with the egg and then one, two, three, let's see, six larval stages here. And then it pupates and becomes this moth, right? So they are gonna overwinter as a partially grown larvae um, in silk lined tunnels um, in the thatch. And so that's kind of why they call that that webworm. They kind of make a little bit of this um, silk uh, like product to uh, hide and hide in and make their little homes in and stuff like that. Um, and so, um, kind of like a white grub where they're going to be as a partially grown larvae, just like that. So, um, and then in April or early May, they're going to resume that larval activity for a while. Then they pupate um, and about mid-May to mid-June, you have the adults coming out. Um, and the adults um, are going to be just resting on the plants during the day. And they like that, uh, like I said, at dusk, that's when you're going to see them one, when you're wandering out in the lawn. Um, and the eggs only take about a week to hatch, but um, you can have two to three generations per year. <clears throat> I think uh, when I was doing the research, I think it was two and a half generations in Nebraska. So, um, and then you got six weeks from egg to adult. So it doesn't take very long. So that's why we can have that, but the generations can overlap. And so during later summer timeframe, you might notice where you can find a lot of, or all the stages being present. Um, in the in the lawn. So 
So the damage um, from the larvae, again, not from the moth, the adults actually don't feed. They don't have um, the mouth parts to feed. So they don't do that. They do all their feeding as larvae. And they're gonna cut off those grass blades uh, just above the thatch line and then pull them into their tunnels and eat them. And they're gonna feed on the leaves and the stems um, right at that soil surface. And again, they're, they're nocturnal. Um, so you might see those small ragged brown spots in the lawn, um, kind of like what's shown in this picture here, might have like a scalped appearance to the lawn. So a scalped appearance would be like if you mow too short and you're scalping it, so you're cutting it right off um, where there, there's no, not much leaf material left. Um, and as you know, they can grow and coalesce just like with dollar spot and things like that, what Kyle was talking about. Um, and then they um, are most active during that early spring through fall. So, um, but most, most of your damage is later in the, in the summer, mid to late summer. This one, we've got a higher threshold. Um, we can withstand about 15 or more larvae per square yard. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more. Um, as with um, the bill bug, I don't see a lot of sod webworm as either. Um, and we, we would have sod webworm, but the thing is that um, due to predators and environmental conditions and birds, which are one of the predators, but other insect predators, birds, things like that, um, and different environmental conditions, the eggs and larvae actually are managed pretty well through biological control and um, environmental damage. Um, so we don't usually see a problem with sod webworm because they have enough natural enemies, basically. Um, so if you think you've got a problem, you may, you know, see a lot of moths moving around, flying in that zigzag pattern as you're walking through the lawn. Um, give it a couple of weeks and then you can check for those larvae. And again, you're doing that soapy water solution or if you wanted a little bit of permethrin, either one, in the water. Um, and then you pour that over that square yard or square foot or however you want to do that. Um, just know that it's 15 larvae per square yard to warrant those insecticide applications. So, so um, but you know, that coffee can technique works really well with any of these to see what you've got. Um, and if you are needing to treat for them, um, you know, mowing and removing those clippings prior to insecticides to make sure that they really get down, um, that insecticide gets down to where the sod webworm is active um, so that you can get a better kill on them. Um, and then you might want to irrigate prior to that as well, so that um, the irrigation will move those larvae further up in the soil profile and make it um, make that insecticide more uh, more effective as well. Um, and you can use a lot of different insecticides: um, bifenthrin, cyfluthrin, permethrin, carvaryl, Bt, chlorantraniloprol. Any of those products um, will work. And in parentheses behind those. Uh, behind the active ingredient, I do have those trade names. Um, so we, we would know Tempo and Seven and Acelacrin and Talstar, things like that. So um, any of those are going to work, but you can see that um, a lot of them kind of overlap on what product will work on these three, but the timing does not line up. Um, so um, the sod webworm is going to be a little later in the season um, than all of them, I would think. And like I said, this one should take care of itself pretty well on its own. So.